This all started for me at university. Go and do a project on real engineering. Engineering that would affect me, my environment and the world. I needed help and who better to ask than my father's friend. You're in shipping, I said. Got any ideas? Oily water, he said. Oily water? Oily water, leave it to me. I said, why not the main engines? Or the generators? Or even the control systems? But no, he insisted, it's got to be oily water. Because it's a problem, we can't just dump into the sea like we used to. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Hello. I've got something for you. So, oily water, where is it then? Oily water, it accumulates in the bilge wells and then we pump it into the bilge holding tank. Where does this stuff come from? That's a good question. There's more than one answer, though. First of all, some of this oily water shouldn't be here. I'll show you around. Can I take some photos? Yeah. When you run machinery, you get leaks. It's inevitable. But routine maintenance helps keep on top of it. So what's that guy doing over there? Ah, he's spotted a leak. And that's just what we want to see. We want everyone to keep their eyes open all the time and not to notice a leak without doing something about it. Because I suppose even small leaks matter. Oh, you'd be surprised. I mean, you get a drip every second. That can amount to 30 or 40 litres a day going into the bilges. And as well as dealing with small leaks, we've got to watch out for serious spills. Like? Overflows, uh, hoses bursting, flounges leaking during bunkering, that kind of thing. We keep the drip trays clean that are under the machines and then we carefully empty those into the waste oil tank. It's particularly important that we keep as much oil out of the bilgers as we possibly can. Oh, well, why is that? Because the more oil there is in the water, the harder it is for the separator to reduce the oil content to a level in which we can discard it overboard. Sugar? No, thank you. And as well as trying to keep the oil out of the bilgers, we keep the bilgers and the holding tank clean as possible and by doing that, the separators work much better. Anyone who works on a ship with oil, whether it be filter elements or oily rags, needs to make sure that they dispose of those properly. So that's it then? Leaks, serious spills, overflows, handling anything with oil Not on it? Not quite, here, let me show you. Oily water from the bilges is pumped into the bilge holding tank. This allows some of the oil to be drawn off, but most of what ends up in that tank doesn't come from the leaks and so on we've just been talking about. Do you know what that is? The main engine turbocharger. And the charge air receiver below it. There's an air cooler. Water condenses on that as the air's heated, compressed and cooled. And it drains into the holding tank. Yeah, but that's not the only place where oily water comes from. And the oil purifiers? Yeah, the dirty water generated by the purification process goes into one of the ship's sludge tanks. As the contents of these tanks settle, we decan the water from them into the holding tank. Reefers, refrigeration and air conditioning units all produce their fair share of water but none of it's clean. So these days, we've got to pump it from the holding tanks through the separator. I suppose in the old days, ships like this just used to dump their dirty water over the side. Can't do that anymore. Do you know what a marpole is? Oh, some kind of regulation about marine pollution? That's right. It's the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, MARPOL for short. MARPOL says that we're allowed to discharge overboard water with an oil content of less than 15 parts per million. 
If it comes out the separator over 15 parts per million, it goes back into the holding tank. And the oil that's extracted by the separator goes into the waste oil tank. OK. So what does 15 parts per million actually look like? It's about what's left in my teacup in one cubic metre of water. So you're going to show me the separator now? Not yet. We've got something else I need to talk to you about first. Cleaning. Oil and water don't mix. When your hands are covered in oil, what do you use to clean them? A Svolfiga. But that's an emulsifier, a chemical that stabilises a water-oil mix. Can't use that in the engine room. Why? Uh, does it keep the separators from working? Actually, it's OK for washing your hands because the sink drains into the grey water line of the sewage system. But for anything that might end up in the bilges, we need to use a special non-emulsifying cleaner. And that's the problem? No, not for most cleaning jobs, but it's not as powerful as an emulsifier. And when we have to clean the oil that accumulates on the outside of the air cooler in the charged air receiver, it doesn't work properly. We have to use an emulsifier. So what's the solution then? There isn't a perfect solution, but adding a drum of quick-breaking chemical to break down the emulsion seems to work quite well. So what do you do when you use gas oil as a cleaner? Obviously, we don't want the dirt oil to end up in the bilges, and anybody who does this job on board should know how to get rid of it properly. What we normally do is put it in the fuel oil sludge tank. Should we get some fresh air? There's a waste heat recovery unit in the funnel, and not surprisingly, it gets dirty and needs cleaning. That's not a problem at sea. The steam soot blowers simply blow the soot out of the funnel. But in port, we use water, a pressure washer. With a cleaning fluid? No, the problem's the soot. If the water's full of soot particles, it'll pass through the separator OK, but because the water's cloudy, the oil content monitor won't work and that won't allow the overboard discharge valve to open and the whole lot will end up back into the bilge holding tank. So what's the solution? What we do is we drain the sooty water into a weir tank which allows the soot to settle out. We then let the water drain into the bilge hold tanks, bag up the soot and dispose of it ashore. But in rough seas, the soot doesn't settle, so we have to plan this cleaning job with one eye on the weather. And if there isn't a weir tank? It goes into a sludge tank for pumping ashore. OK. So now can we see the separator? Let's have some tea first. mixture is sucked by a pump into the separator in the middle, like this. And the first step is to slow the flow down as much as possible to give the separator time to work. This is where the majority of oil separates using gravity. In this one, corrugated plates are used to increase the surface area which encourages the globules of oil to stick together and rise into the oil chamber. There are two probes that control the amount of dirty water in the machine. The first cuts the pump that is filling the unit and so gives it time to separate, and the other switches on when the oil chamber is full to discharge the separated oil. The cycle of fill, weight and discharge continues for as long as there is dirty water to separate. Remember that the unit is filled by sucking the water through it. Pushing it through a high-speed pump would just emulsify the oil-water mix and stop any separation at all. So, put oily water in a jar, and given time it will separate. 
pump it at high speed through a narrow pipe and it never will. Different designs vary in how they slow the flow, but basically they're taking the oily water from a narrow inlet pipe into a much wider container. Isn't there a problem with heavier fractions of oil? I mean, their specific gravities aren't so different from water, so what do you do about that? Heat. On this ship, we have heat coils built into the holding tank and the separator. We heat the mixture to encourage as much separation as possible before we turn on the separator. So is the oil and water drawn off at the top and bottom of stage one? Not at the same time. Discharge is controlled by solenoid operating valves. Capacitance probes? Yeah, initially the separator is full of water. As the oil builds up, the capacitance changes until it reaches a preset level. This automatically opens the oil dump valve, which draws off the oil into a waste oil tank. Once most of the oil is gone, the valve closes and the remaining water is drawn off from the bottom into the second stage, the coalescer. Coalescing, that means sticking together. So sticking what together? The drops of oil remaining in the water after the first stage are so small that the force of friction between them and the water is stronger than the buoyancy force pushing them upwards. And the mix won't separate unless we make the drops bigger and that's exactly what the second stage does. What happens if you double the diameter of each drop to the surface area? Um, the area increases by a factor of four. And the volume? At the same time, the volume increases by a factor of eight. And because buoyancy depends on volume and friction upon area, the buoyancy overcomes the friction and the larger drops rise. Exactly. The coalescing stage encourages the tiny drops of oil to stick together by passing the water from the first stage through a filter. The water passes through easily, but the oil sticks to it and forms into larger drops. As these are forced through, they rise to the top where the oil is drawn off. The water, which by this stage should contain less than 15 parts per million of oil, it passes through a membrane and is drawn off at the bottom. There's something else I want to show you. Tell me more about this 15 parts per million. I mean, how do you know you're within the standard? I suppose guessing isn't good enough. No, not really. 15 parts per million is about that much out of that much oil. And that's why we have an oil content monitor. This is how it works. Infrared light is shone through the water from the separator and onto a photo detector on the other side. If the water is 100% pure, the light will shine straight through. But it gets deflected by tiny drops of oil that haven't been removed by the separator. The more oil there is, the greater the scattering of light. So, I can see why you have to keep sit out of this system. Yes, and any other stray particles. Such as? Rust, dirt, paint chippings. Sorry, I asked. The manufacturers calibrate their monitors to measure oil concentration. If this goes over 15 parts per million, the overboard discharge outlet of this three-way valve closes and an alarm sounds, and the water is directed back into the holding tank and on some ships into the sludge tank. So you run it until that happens? Well, the engineer operating the separator should have a good idea of how much pumpable water there is left in the system so he can stop it well before it gets pumped full of concentrated oil. So it's left to the engineer to decide? Not always. Like many ships, we've got a float in the bilge tanks, which stops the separator well before it's empty. Oh, another thing. Do you think sea conditions matter? Sure. Oily water needs to be as still as possible. Dead right. The next thing I need to show you is the separator working. But before I do that, you've seen where oily water comes from and how we deal with it. Any thoughts? Well, I don't want to seem rude or anything, but it just doesn't seem very reliable. I mean, you've got this really tough international standard, strictly enforced, but the piece of kit you've got to meet that standard has trouble coping with dirt and soot and emulsifiers and concentrated oils and sea conditions and, and maybe some stuff we haven't even talked about yet. Have I got that right? Well, actually, most of the time we get it to work perfectly well, but I won't pretend that it's always easy. Fortunately, there's a new generation of separators that deal with all the problems that you mentioned. Good, how do they work? 
It varies. Some manufacturers are using centrifuges, some are using sophisticated membrane systems, some are using bacteria to destroy the oil and the grease. Like in a sewage treatment plant? Exactly. And there are the non-discharge separators that can evaporate the water. All of them are perfectly capable of reducing the oil content well below 15 parts per million. They run automatically, they can handle any kind of oil and any impurities that oil may contain. But there's one remaining problem. Cost. Exactly, they're more expensive. So we need a new regulation. And that's just what we've got. Pass me the Marpol book. It applies to all ships whose keels were laid after the beginning of 2005 and also to replacement separators fitted to older ships as well. The spec can only be met by the new generation of separators. So this part of the engineer's job is going to be easier in future? Yes, but it will be some time before the conventional separators disappear. It's good practice to put the manufacturer's operating instructions close to the separator and systematically follow the steps laid out for running it. Who operates the separator? Obviously, it has to be someone who's been properly trained and is competent. It's important for junior members of the engineering team to be able to operate the equipment. When the engineer runs the separator, the last thing he does is to back flush with clean water. That cleans the filters in the coalescer and removes any oil in the separator stage. Once he's done that, he fills the separator with clean water. That way he can be sure it's clean the next time it's used. Of course, when flushing the separator, it must be impossible for the overboard discharge valve to open. Why? Because we have to be able to show that any water that goes over the side has been properly separated and its oil content accurately checked. What's the white box? What's it for? It's a bit like the black box on a plane. It's for protection, yours and mine. The chief engineer's got the key. That means no one can interfere with the monitor or the three-way valve while the separator is operating. That's not the only protective measure we take. Look at these valves and flanges. They're all sealed with plastic. Where we use padlocks, the chief engineer keeps the keys. Where we use numbered plastic seals, we record the seal numbers in the engine logbooks. Why plastic, do you think? So we can break them and open them quickly in an emergency? Right. That's the only time we're allowed to pump dirty water overboard. So what about maintenance? I assume manufacturers supply detailed preventative maintenance programs. Obviously, when we maintain a separator, we make sure we use the manufacturer's manual. But although the operational manual contains a detailed fault list, it doesn't come with a standard PMS. Sorry, PMS? Planned maintenance schedule. Required maintenance frequency depends entirely upon usage, and that varies from ship to ship. What do you think a standard PMS should cover? Opening the separators and cleaning them. Anything else? Checking that the three-way valve and the alarm works. What about the monitor? Does it need regular recalibration? It does, and that's something that we can't do on board. We can and do test the monitor, but recalibration is a job for someone who's properly qualified. So what tests do you do? We run fresh water through the monitor before each use and check for zero readings and there's no alarms. Bridge. Yeah. Who's that? It's the ECR. Why are they calling? At the beginning and end of separation, they have to find out precisely where the ship is. Don't modern oil content monitors do this for you? No, they don't. We have to speak to the bridge and get a GPS reading that we can enter into the oil record book, along with other information as required by MARPOL. And remember, it's not just about the international regulations. Some company standing orders are even tougher. Tell me something. Suppose you were operating the separator and something went wrong. Like what? Well, let's see. Say, pumping performance was very low. I check the manual to see what the problem is. That's all very well, but when the separator goes wrong, you shut it down before anything else. Then you can read the manual. Whatever happens, we have to make sure that no oil goes into the sea. 
well, no more than 15 parts per million, that is. OK. And there's another thing about situations like this. We mustn't be tempted to get too clever. What do you mean? Sometimes, not often, I hope, you'll see a solution to an oily water problem that involves breaking the rules. Don't. It's not worth it. If the only solution is illegal, we dump the problem on the shore office, not over the side. We have to be very, very careful. So, oily water separators. Fascinating. Would you like to stay for dinner? I'd love to, but I think my taxi will be here in a minute. There's more to this oily water than I thought, like where it comes from, how to control the amount and content reaching the bilges, how to run and maintain the separator, how the oil content monitor works, and how to make sure we understand the regulations and, most importantly, show we've stuck to them.